welcome to Festival in My House and Yours. As part of the weekly series of live streams, discussions and broadcasts that make up the MIF Live programme. This is Paying Attention, a queer literature festival live streamed straight from my bedroom in my friends' homes. My name is Roma Havers and I am a poet and a facilitator. What you're about to witness is a short series of interviews and performances between some of my favourite queer writers in Manchester. Poets, playwrights, novelists, and those working across and outside of form. When this crisis came about, I and many other artists I spoke to felt overwhelmed by the pressure to create, the pressure to respond, the fixation with making art for now, about now. Paying attention was my attempt to allow queer writers to reflect, to connect with each other, share some work they're proud of with no attention to now, except to each other. I'm so excited for the five other writers reading and talking this evening to answer this question. Now you have our attention. How do you want to be read? In a moment, you will hear three 20 minute conversations between Rosie Garland and Oke Chukun in Zulu, Mandalore and El Otomiwo, and myself and Frankie Blouse. Without further ado, let's go to the first conversation. Um, I'm going to read their bios and then I'm going to let them get to the reading slash conversation. Um, so Rosie Garland um, writes novels, short fiction, poetry, and sings with the post-punk band, The March Violets. With a passion for language nurtured by public libraries, her work appeared in Under the Radar, Butcher's Dog, The North, Spelt, The Alto, Mislexia, and elsewhere. Her debut novel, The Palace of Curiosities, was nominated for both the Desmond Elliott and the Polari First Book Prize. And latest novel, The Night Brother, is described by the Times of London as a delight, playful and exuberant with shades of Angela Carter. <laughs> Her new poetry collection, What Girls Do in the Dark, is forthcoming from Nine Arches Press in October 2020. And in 2019, Val McDermott named her as one of the 10 most compelling LGBTQ writers in the UK today. And then we have Oki Chukwunu Zulu. Oki is a writer and a teacher. He was born in Manchester in 1988, read English at Girton College, Cambridge, and completed the Teach First programme. His work has been published and broadcast in Agenda, PN Review, Roundhouse Radio, BBC Radio 3, and Grazia, among others. In 2015, he was the recipient of the New Writing North Award. His debut novel, the private novel, The Private Joys of Nena Maloney, was published by Dialogue Books in 2019 and was long listed for the Desmond Elliott Prize. I'm going to leave you to your readings now. It's absolutely lovely to be here today. Um, it's, and yeah, we were talking earlier about how great it is just to connect in this different way while we're all at home. I'd like to point out, I've got all my kind of posh author books behind me to prove that I read books. And uh, I'm going to read a short passage from The Night Brother, my most recent novel. And um, the reason I chose it is because it takes place in a 19th century underground gay club back in the day when we were allowed to go outdoors and meet people. So this might, even if people can't remember as far back as the 19th century, they can remember what it was like going to a club. And the main character is a young woman called Edie, and she has made friends with a very flamboyant young man that she works with called Guy. We scurry along and come to a halt at the top of a flight of stairs I'd have walked down otherwise. Guy skips down and proceeds to wrap upon the door a hodgepodge of long and short knocks. The door looks as if it hasn't opened in an age, but open it does. A half inch that unleashes a blade of light into the filthy stairwell. Guy whispers through the slot and the door swings back. I expect the hinges to shriek, but all is oiled silence. Guy looks up at me. Are you going to stay there all night? Sesame has opened. I pick my way down through the rubbish, trailing my skirt in, goodness knows what foulness, and step within. A long, low-ceilinged room presents itself, narrow and dry with a smell of long-gone cheeses. 
In contrast with the entrance, all is swept perfectly clean. At regular intervals, a beer barrel set upright for use as tables, candles upon saucers cast a cheerful glow. The place is crowded with men and women chattering in low voices. Young chaps weave through the throng, carrying trays of sandwiches. What is this place? I whisper. I didn't know it existed. Few do, says Guy. Skittles by day, mollies by night. Ah, oh, what fun. Everyone is here, stuffing their faces with supper and remarking on the smart new pair. Who? I say. Us, you silly goose. A slender youth swings by with a basket of bottles. What have we here, says Guy? Ambrosia, nectar drawn from the fountain of youth? Beer or lemonade, comes the answer. Alas and alack, Guy sighs, beer for me. How about you, Edie? I plump for lemonade. I thumb down the marble and take a sip, but I'm so distracted by my surroundings that it spills onto my blouse. You're as jumpy as a cat on mischief night, says Guy, drawing out an enormous handkerchief and pressing it to my breasts in a manner that would be unseemly in any other situation. Odd, there's nothing to you, he adds. I felt bigger titties on a butchery gar. Guy, I hiss. Oh, stow it, Edie. Loosen your stays, for tomorrow we die. He declares, swinging an arm theatrically. Of boredom. Those about to be merry, I salute you. His hair, loosened from its carapace of brilliantine, flops over one eyebrow. I cannot help feeling that I am amongst children who, having escaped a dull lesson with a harsh master, have raced from the school gate to this underground haven and are celebrating their freedom. Thank you so much for that reading, Rosie. It's so lovely to hear. That. I love, I love hearing that part of the novel. Oh, thank um, you. I just wanted to dive in and ask, what inspired or who inspired those two such contrasting characters? Because they work so well together as sort of guy leading Edie into this new and exciting world, and Edie sort of um, is our sort of the the reader's way in and seeing all these new and strange things and these new and strange experiences. And what ex what inspired those two characters for you? Um, it's pretty simple, really. I can remember very, very clearly what it was like when I felt really inexperienced, when I felt like I was the only one in the world. And um, I'd grown up in a small village in England, and uh, there are lots of disadvantages if you're the um, only lesbian in the village. And, uh, and I can remember people taking me under their wing when I moved north to the cities of the north and um, taking me out to gay clubs and gay bars and gay venues for the first time and just like how exciting yes. and terrifying and thrilling and like, you know, bursting into song, oh sweet mystery of life now that I've found you. So that, yeah, that's where that comes from. Yeah. I think there's a really universal element to it, that sort of sense of discovery and excitement and slight fear. Um, but at the same time, the details that you add to it make it so convincing and so enveloping okay. this world. What was the research like when you were trying to put together this sort of world of days gone by? Um, well, uh, Manchester's a great place to research because The Night Brother is definitely set in Manchester. There aren't enough novels set in Manchester and mm. I love the place. I, I'm very passionate about it. And um, so I did a load of research in the Central Library, which has got great mm. archives, especially photographs. I, um, I'm very inspired by visual research as well as reading about stuff because pictures tell such a story. Photos tell can really tell me a lot more about people than just reading descriptions of them. Yeah, that's a really interesting point, isn't it? I think there's, that's what I lo love about your writing is it feels so evocative and so uh, visual. Like I feel um, like I'm really there. Is it, was it strange for you reading that in this time when the only 
sort of environment that we can experience on the four walls around us? Is it strange for you to go back to that? Um, yes and no. Um, the no is about the fact that um, I guess books have always taken me to places I can't go. Um, as I say, growing up as a, a lonely, um, isolated kid, books were my gateway to the world. They were my escape. And so um, that's one of the things that I'm really enjoying at the moment is doing a lot of reading. I mean, I always read, but I'm kind of doing, I'm reading with people, like we're starting a book at the same time and yes. talking about it. So books are the way out. They're the way to the world when we can't go out into it, maybe. That's fantastic, I think. And the same is really true for me, definitely. When I was growing up, books were a way of exploring other experiences and identities that I couldn't quite inhabit myself. And I wondered what books inspired you when you were growing up or what sort of um, talismans you always returned to. Do you know, something that I loved when I was younger, and I still like it now, although I don't read it as much, um, and it's part of that gateway to other worlds is I read a load of fairy stories. I read a load of fantasy. Um, I read Edgar Allan Poe, Angela Carter, but I also read a lot of pretty rubbishy science fiction and fantasy <laughs> and I'm out and proud about it. I don't care if that's fashionable or not. Um, it, even if I look back on it now and think, God, that's so badly written. It took me to impossible elsewheres and elsewhens, and it, it gave me permission to explore places that aren't real and fed my imagination. Yeah, I think that's really important to sort of avoid the, the hierarchies of sort of categorization that we often get. You know, it's so easy to be dismissive of this genre of literature or yeah. literature by these types of people but actually I think it's important to try and have that, that open mind um would you or do you feel that there's a category that you would like your books to be seen within um well I'd just like everyone to read them yeah. I, I, I I'm, yeah. not, I'm, I'm not snobby about genre but yeah let's everyone come in Anyway, look, I've said a lot. How about over to you? I want to oh. hear. I want to hear you read. Oh well, thank you very much. So um, I'm going to read from my novel, The Private Joys of Nana Maloney, um, and I thought I'd just start at the beginning. Um, this book is set between Cambridge and Manchester, and um, in the beginning, we meet Nana. The, we meet the main character, Nana's parents, before they've met each other, um, and I'll just dive in. This is set in Cambridge. We can't use that quote, Joel, said Morris, trying not to lose his temper. He took a deep breath and wondered if he could eat a ginger snap without anyone noticing. Morris knew Maka had finally given in and agreed to host a meeting for their newly formed, but already turbulent, evangelical group in his flat, which was a 15-minute cycle from the centre of Cambridge. It was 1992, two years since he had graduated from university, and he saw fewer and fewer familiar faces with every passing day. When Morris first joined the group, he had thought it might be a good way to meet new people. The only drawback, he realised, was that he did not like the new people he had met. This was the third day of the third meeting, and it was threatening dangerously to spill over into a fourth. He welcomed the Bible study group into his pokey flat, which he had refused to clean beforehand in case it made them feel like they were welcome to stay beyond the parameters of the study group. Parameters which he had now decided were strictly, even ascetically, ecclesiastical distributed own brown digestives and thin squash in the good biscuits under the sink. Why can't we use it? said Joel. I think it's beautiful. Yes, said Morris, but, but what? Joel Aberhart, whose voice had begun to take on a somewhat confrontational tone, was an economics graduate who was rumoured to, to have turned down a six-figure starting salary to Kathy's ailing mother. Both salary and sciatica remained unverified, but he cultivated a trying air of martyrdom which had made more than one person at St. Jude's think about breaking him on the wheel. And he chewed his biscuits with his mouth open. Listen, he said generously, for he is hated by the hypocrite and miser, for the former is afraid of detection, for the latter refuses the charge, for he camels his back to bear the first notion of business, for he is good to think on if a man would express himself neatly, for he made a great figure in Egypt for his signal services, 
Can't you see how beautiful it is? He said. Well, said Morris, trying to be reasonable, it's very beautiful, but that isn't from the Bible, is it? It's from Jubilate Agno by Christopher Smart. Why did people always assume that he didn't read? Was it because he was an engineer or because he was Nigerian or both? It's a nice poem, Joel, but he's talking about his cat. And what's wrong with that, Joel huffed? Well, there's nothing wrong with it, said Morris, but this is supposed to be an extension of the Bible study group. The whole point of this was to get to know the Bible better by sharing it with others, to explore how we can spread the good news in a real world setting. The setting was to be Bertie's, a small independent cafe on Huntington Road, the route northwards out of the city. It was noticeably more popular with locals than with their average Cambridge student, liable to blanch at the prospect of a 15 minute walk in a city where everything was a stone's throw away. For Morris and the young men who accompanied him in baggy t-shirts and contrite expressions, the cafe was ideal because the clientele mostly consisted of working professionals who were usually too busy to respond to their evangelism with lengthy arguments about the Big Bang and natural selection, which academics brandished with such glee. These people were easier. They simply frowned, accepted the postcards with biblical extracts written on them. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, said the picture of King's College Chapel. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight, said the river cat. And they went back to their godless lives, perhaps somewhat inspired, perhaps not. While lawyers and estate agents and consultants spread thick marmalade on their toast, Morris and his friends spread the word of God. Morris, however, thought they might be laying it on a bit thick. And I'll leave it there. <laughs> Wonderful. Absolutely yes, love yes. it. Um, I, I, again, it's like, I, I guess I would open by sort of like asking if there was a particular reason why you chose that passage to read now while we're in lockdown. Yeah, I think I wanted to sort of give a sense to the novel's opening. And for me, it's really nice because it's an, a different location. It's so Cambridge and Manchester are the two cities where this is set and they're two cities that I know pretty well. Um, and they're very, very different. And I really wanted to sort of give a sense of Cambridge being this place which is, um, magical but also very very strange in its own particular way um all the characters in that bible study group um have their own issues and their own sort of curiosities about life and their own questions about god and religion and they progress through those as they go through life in the novel um but they're all i think attracted to one another by their intensity of ca character and the fact that yeah. they all look at life very very seriously which has its joys and its um difficulties i think and that harks back to the title of the book as well. Um, um, and I love the contrast, the way that you do have these two really contrasting cities in the novel. Um, and you say they are cities that you know, but there is something about the way you capture that. It's the details I really love. That detail about the good biscuits being under the sink, that captures... It really shows me what this character is like without having to tell me in too much. You know, you're really great at showing rather than telling. What's that like for you as a writer? Really, thank you. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed writing this. Um, and I think for me as a writer, I tend to lean away from show rather than tell by, by nature. Um, I, my sort of first literary loves, I suppose, were people like Jane Austen, who are just like you, I love libraries. I just went into a library when I was a teenager and sort of picked up Pride and Prejudice and thought, well, let's see what all the fuss is about. And Jane Austen doesn't really do show as much as she does tell. She does a lot of um, telling us who's a good character straight away. She'll say, this person is quite selfish. This person's a bit petty. Um, so it was kind of an experiment for me to, to, to kind of move away from that. And I really enjoyed it because it allows you to inhabit a character a lot more interestingly, I think, as a writer, it allows you to get into their mind. And to kind of inhabit that kind of pettiness <laughs> was quite a lot of fun. <laughs> like, we'll not have the nice biscuits. And I love the way you inhabit characters. You have these characters presented to us right at the start of the book. And later on, obviously, you have Nena, who, um, and I, you know, every, nobody makes a fuss when women write about male characters with sort of like authority but um let's face it we often find that uh, you know there is that trope that meme that male writers 
struggle, but you do not. And I'd love to know what that process was like for you, being able to capture the cap the character of Nena and make her so real. It's a oh. such an achievement. Thank you very much. Um, and I think you're right. It is an interesting contrast the way that women have write, written about men and vice versa. Um, one of my favourite books of all time, actually, um, Mary Reynolds, The Charioteer, um, a woman writing about men and brilliantly. Wonderful, yeah. It's such a great book, isn't it? And um, Marvellous. Beautifully written, absolutely beautiful. Um, and for me, writing about a woman, about multiple women, um, it wasn't really a process. It was really, I thought about this a lot. It was very much something I did for sort of emotional reasons, because, you know, I grew up with a single mum, so I wanted to reflect that experience in my writing. Nana grows up with a single mum as well. Um, and the process of sort of imagining Nana and her life, it was very much drawn from things that I've seen in the world and things that I have observed and thought about. Um, it felt natural in a way. Um, I was writing about a human Nana. I don't sort of lead with the things that make her <laughs> and is, a th is a thing. I sort of, um, I led with the things that make Nana who she is. Um, and that was what made it fun and hopefully what makes it convincing. Um, because it's Absolutely. just yeah. about how people are different. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And I love that when you said I, I approached her, I wrote about her as though she was a human. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Um, also, I've got to say, the Bible, you open the book with a Bible. I love the little, I don't know where, I'm sure it was conscious because no writer does anything by mistake, but that little bit, he will make your path straight. <laughs> but come on, let, let's talk about that a bit. Yeah, this book is a sort of a mishmash of so many different things. Queerness is definitely one of them, but also sure. so is the Bible. And yeah. I yeah. wanted to, again, it was about reflecting my own experiences and the things that have sort of led me to this point. And I am not a religious person now. I don't, I don't have a religious faith, but I grew up in the church and I took it seriously. And I really thought very hard about what, you know, God wants from humanity and how to live a good life in the garden. I wanted to reflect that struggle. That's a struggle that Morris, Nenna's father, he undergoes, so do all the people in the study group in one way or another. And even though I don't believe in God now, I still find certain resonances in biblical scripture. I think it's so fascinating and some of it is really, really beautiful just as literature. So I wanted yeah. to And as you, as you so rightly put it, tension is what makes a novel interesting. Yeah. Tension is what makes a story interesting and you've just got it in one. Oh, thank you so much, Rosie. Thank you. Yeah. It's been great to talk with you, Oki. Brilliant. Absolutely it's brilliant. It's so lovely to see you again. I hope so. <laughs> Hi, welcome to part two of Paying Attention. Next up, we've got two amazing poets slash writers slash theatre makers. Um, first, we have Ella Artemiwo. Um, Ella is a poet, although she calls herself a word artist when she's feeling pretentious. She found her voice in the spoken word community years ago, but now writes for both the page and the stage. Ella likes to take inspiration from a wide array of places as possible, but many of her ideas come to her while she's cycling around the city in her bright orange helmet. And we also have with us Mandla Ray. Mandla Ray is a Zimbabwean writer and performer. They are queer and agender and make work about their intersecting identities. Mandla is currently developing their first solo show as British as a watermelon. This is something in our genes. My morning changed when I birthed my mother. I woke up craving peaches. I woke up clutching the edges of my bed, heaving her breath from my mouth. I tried to soothe myself and my mother through the womb, asked her if she was ready. The morning that I birthed my mother was the day the sky split like a nectarine. My abdomen groaned and my lungs birthed through their ribcage shaped like mother's hands. It was her hand pressing the damp cloth to my head as I birthed her. Aware of my stretch joints, bone to bone they swelled. The womb, a shielded citadel that bonded, burned and birthed us both. A heavy inheritance for my daughter. Thank you. 
Oh. Yeah, that was something in our genes. Wow. Like it. <laughs> it's funny because I, I was like reading the version that you sent me um, on the 9th of October 2019. Um, oh, yeah. Um, I it slightly. yeah, it's nice to like. <laughs> See your edits and um, yeah, the way that the last line has changed as well. It's just completely like flipped. Um, I think yeah, it's very beautiful, very powerful. Thank you. Yeah, I quite yeah. I was thinking about the last line. I have the inheritance for my daughter. I I kept changing it because I couldn't quite figure out how I wanted the end of the poem to land because it's so mm -hmm. kind of dreamlike in some ways. The idea of well it is the idea of birthing your own mother so I kind of wanted the ending to ground it a little bit and to mm. remind people that it's about generations and inheritance and things that are real and it's yeah there is this kind of dream sequence in it but yeah that was how I came to that. <laughs> how did you come to write it? Um, it started as a free write in a workshop that, yeah, the morning that I birthed my mother, just that, that image or that concept, I really, I really enjoyed that. Um, yeah, and then from this free write, I kind of went home and sort of highlighted all the bits that I liked and that made sense and that had kind of images I wanted to work with and then put it into yeah this poem that kind of snakes across the, the page I'm really kind of fascinated by birth I've never given birth I feel like I should say that as a I'm as a terrified of giving birth like <laughs> there is nothing more terrifying. terrifying pregnant no I feel like I I want to be pregnant and I want to give birth at some point in my life but yeah I never have for now I just write about it in in strange way I actually haven't shown my mother this poem <laughs> I, know. I guess I can hear it now um I suppose because although in some ways it is about that that there is some link to me and my mother but a lot of it is just about um kind of generations in in general and generational mm. trauma and how that's passed through families and so it's not completely about my family it was more just about the idea of a daughter birthing mm -hmm. her own mother but I guess the bits that are linked to my mother, um, I asked her what she was craving when she was pregnant with me and peaches came up, nice. um, which is great. So I got the peaches and nectarines in there, which I think is great because cut open, they look like rollers. Um, I think that most fruit and flowers look like rollers. Um, but yeah, I felt like I had to throw those images in there because I think <laughs> I thought it was beautiful. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Always love a bit of vulva imagery. Who doesn't? Always, always. <laughs> yeah, I forgot actually that I sent an old version to you. I think I'm often kind of updating pieces though, especially ones that I perform a lot. I don't like when I get into this kind of habit of a one way of performing a piece. It almost, even though it's fresh to the audience, it starts getting boring to me. And then I think, mm, mm. that line doesn't work anymore. Or I don't like the rhythm that I say that in. I need to change it up. So there probably are several versions of this poem out. Yeah. The but, uh, yeah, no. This is one for now. <laughs> nice. Hmm. No, po I feel like poems do need to kind of be evolving in some way. Um, yeah. I like have a poem that I got published last year and then after that publication I was like looking at it in the book and I was like mm, this isn't even how I perform it anymore. <laughs> yeah it happens though or like <laughs> videos of myself performing is um I can't, I can't watch myself because I'm I watch I'm like no no that's that's not right and I know it was me <laughs> but it's not. <laughs> <laughs> have this idea of the perfect poem in my head and like whenever I I'm always kind of trying attempting to get to that and then I kind of read back or watch old old pieces and I'm like it's not there still <laughs> no yeah 
I hate like um, hearing my voice in recording. Yeah, I it's just I'm like that's not what I sound like. That's not <laughs> <laughs> what I want in our own heads. Yeah, <laughs> it's odd because I guess when I write, I do write to the rhythm of my own voice or thinking mm. about my own kind of inflections or the emphasis that I would just naturally put on 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 words or on things that are important to me so when I hear someone else read a piece of mine I'm like it takes me by surprise in a really good way I kind of like that because yeah. I'm so used to writing for performance mm. um that yeah hearing someone else read it I'm like oh okay this is what this is what you heard this is where you went with that mm. See, if you, I never hear other people reading my work. I feel like I'd be really, I don't know, I'd be like, hmm. It's yeah, quite vulnerable, I think. To, yeah, it's like someone reading, I mean, yeah, it's, it's your poetry, it's your work, it feels personal. Mm. And you kind of have to let go of that ownership of it as well, which is quite scary. Yeah. And like, I don't know, I suppose because I always just write things for me to perform yeah. or whatever. I'd just be a bit like, mm, I don't know, unless like we had another Zimbabwean queer <laughs> immigrant person. <laughs> I just like, mm. you would want to read your work. Pardon? Is it um, so like, I don't know, like with the show, it's weird. I've sort of like thought about how it would feel to like, have someone else do it like maybe say like if I got sick or something like during a tour like I don't know um and like just because it's quite like an intense show and quite like I don't know just reliving my own pain and traumas yay um I think that like I don't know yeah it would be interesting to kind of have someone else um yeah because I guess a play is almost going it's another a level but because they're kind of coming into the they'd be yeah playing you in like a really real way they'd be putting on this character and yeah and yeah. I felt like I don't know a lot of the things are not I like things that are that I talk about sort of like things that could happen to like anyone mm -hmm. I guess yeah. and not just like my experiences I don't know yeah, um, I've decided, <laughs> I know I said I'd read one poem, but I think I'm going to read another one. Okay. Last minute, um, poem change. Last minute changes, that's fine. Last minute change, like, so non-committal. <laughs> um, you know this one, because um, I think you've been at every performance I've done for a really long time now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's called Zimbabwe. <clears throat> Zimbabwe, your screams are heard on the moon. You are the corpses of stars. You are more than each diamond ripped from your earth. I once intended to amount to nothing, but you refused. You talked about reclaiming a sense of self from stolen land. You inhaled a breath of contaminated air. Man-made, you tear yourself out of your skin. You will be remembered as a desperation, a longing. Stitch me into your bones. You have forgiven too much. Teach me sainthood, you. Wena, who is so deliberate, you, Wena, who weaved earth and blood into mountains and monuments, Wena, the embodiment of reincarnation, Zimbabwe, your son is weeping. Where have you fled at the break of dawn when children scream your name in tongues buried alongside your ancestry to conceal a state of emergency? 
claiming your wounds as the spoils. The evolution of mischievous man is burning you alive. Zimbabwe, your bones will rise again. And yeah, that's Thank Zimbabwe. You. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. I have heard that performed before. Mm. When did you write it? Um, so I wrote it just before we did Outspoken, like last year, last February. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I don't know, it's weird, because like, you know the one that I was going to read, um, the Good Black Women, um, yeah. Yeah. I sort of, I don't know, I noticed that, like, I sort of become obsessed with, like, themes or, like, sentences, and we were, when we were talking before, I was saying that, um, there's, like, a sentence from my show that is also in the other poem, and, like, um, the bones rising motif is something that's also present in quite a few things and like yeah I feel like yeah, I've been yeah, thinking yeah, about yeah. yeah I don't know I feel like I I've love been... the bones line <laughs> yeah me too I've literally I don't know ever since I like I don't know like saw like heard the story of me and her hand I've always just sort of like I don't know that image of like her bones rising and like the mythology that surrounds her and like I'm like the fact that that her last words were my bones will rise again I don't know I'm just like obsessed with that it and, is like, reincarnation as a thing um and like I mean yeah that, like oh. of bones as well mm. was that, I'm, yeah I just love that idea of like the molding is yeah a great image yeah. I guess that our, both our poems mirror each other slightly in the kind of Reba, I like yeah, that. and like I wrote mine when I was like thinking about my mum. Um, she there had been like some what was going on in Zimbabwe. I think it was like an oil hike or something, a price in like uh, a hike in the price of oil. So I was like a hundred and fifty percent like rise, and people were, like protesting, and then the government was like shooting people and like blacking out the internet and stuff and like my mum was in Zimbabwe while all of this was happening and I couldn't like reach her so I was just like yeah yeah I don't know that you wrote about it yeah <laughs> yeah um and she was okay. poem. no I've never showed her any <laughs> of my work oh, any, any. <laughs> no I like I'm, my family have never like seen me perform, never seen any of my work. Um, I feel like, I don't know, I have the freedom to just sort of like do yeah. and say whatever. Whereas like if I was like concerned that they'd be, they'd see it or like, I don't know, worried about upsetting them or something by like a sentence or whatever. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I'm just like, I don't know. They, my dad kind of like, I think he knows that I write and perform, but he's always just sort of like, meh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's quite like um a real job in his eyes yet so oh uh, yeah I'm not a doctor or a lawyer so like what am I doing <laughs> <laughs> yeah no try they're trying again with my younger siblings to like have one who has a a grown-up job <laughs> <laughs> did you have many drafts of that piece or was it one I find there's occasionally poems where I'll write it and it'll, I'll just write it all down and that's kind of it. But was, was it like that? Um, no, I am a serial editor. I never, ever stop editing. Um, but this version that I did, I actually edited with someone else for the first time. Um, oh, nice. With Charlotte Maxwell. Um, yeah. And yeah, so... Yeah, so I edited that along with her. Um, so it didn't it didn't really change too much. But there were like a couple of little bits of sentences here and there that kind of um, moved around. And I hadn't um, put in any Ndebele words, which is my first language. Um, but then I sort of ended up doing that when I was working for it with Charlotte. Um, and that yeah. sort of, I don't know, yeah, adding in bits of my first language something I I only started doing that like a couple of years ago um and like yeah I don't know 
feel like that's how I speak in poetry now just like <laughs> who knows what language that's man. amazing it's so important yeah no, could really you like translate it. the the words for me um yeah so I think it was just one yeah so um well actually it is translated because um so it was a bit where I was going you and then I go when mm. um so again this is yeah we, we know what you're talking about how things look on the page so in the page it's you scratched out and then when which just means you in Dabella. nice so it's written in part four the page then because you I guess yeah you can't pick that up from a, a performance piece yeah um yeah so it was um yeah I was editing with it with Charlotte for a um common word anthology I don't know if I'm allowed to say that yet <laughs> you know when you're literally never sure what you can and can't say you're up to <laughs> we can scratch it if need be that's fine no I don't, I don't. So, so, did you, so when you were writing it was it just um in response to what was happening in Zimbabwe or what was happening in your with your mum and that you wanted to write for that reason or um, is it like is that where you grew out of um yeah I suppose it was just born out of concern for my mum and trying to like communicate with her in some way um mm -hmm. even though I mean like yeah so we talk on whatsapp and like I haven't seen her in like 20 years um and like she only came into my life like a couple of years ago so I feel like I don't know I feel like I've made like a new friend and not so much as like yeah. gained a mother um and I'm still like learning about her life and she's learning about who I am um but like yeah I don't know I suppose I was just kind of trying to I don't know, I just think about her and like the sort of sacrifices that she sort of made and I feel like I have a lot of guilt um because I was yeah. obviously like her firstborn child and she was really really young and um I don't know I feel like her life hasn't really gone very far um and I just I don't know I often wonder like what if she hadn't just like had all these kids and just like lived her best life and, like I'm mm. living now um but obviously that not like to her like she has like six or seven kids to her like ha getting pregnant it's just like okay I'm gonna have a child now like I'm she's just yeah. like a mother that's just like what I do um oh, and I, I yeah sorry. and I don't really understand <laughs> and I don't <laughs> a mother but I'd, I'm really scared of being pregnant um yeah <laughs> thank you hey thank you Welcome to the third part of Paying Attention. Um, this one is going to be between myself and Frankie Blau. So I'm going to read Frankie's bow bio, bow bio um, and get started. So Frankie Blau prefers writing anything to writing ba bios. Such preferences include poetry, no, no disclaimers 2018, plays, body language 2018, imprint 2018 and 2019, and petty subtweets. In 2019, Frankie was selected to participate in Words First, a BBC-led talent search for the best of Britain's emerging poets. They were shortlisted by Andrew Macmillan for the I'll Show You Mine prize. They are currently working on their debut poetry pamphlet, Ours Poetica, which is especially interested in the orphaned and queer experiences of heritage and the reproduction of culture through the sex and sexualized body. So Frankie is I believe going to do a reading but I'm going to share the poem on screen so everyone can see it because it's quite interesting where it's displayed. My fallacies were never pathetic enough. I placed too much of you in the sky knowing I would find myself looking to the ground for loose change. Perhaps predictability renders one understandable in the most unappealing sense. Would rather not be surprised. Would rather pay my way with downward glances. There was money in it once. 
the chicken in the freezer, worn like gauntlet on rainy day. Petty cash to the radiator, statements drying in the hall, curtain for a mediator, waiting for the telephone call, and yes, now is the time to strut about the house, waiting for some ending to announce itself the winner. Yesterday keeps getting bigger. I've been considering the kitchen radio as a serious object of study. It is full of formulas. Only his car will speak of the crackling ocean discovered in the air long ago. The kitchen radio cannot stutter. Its accidents are kept private or are transfigured into spectacle. All things should be recorded. Failing that, they should be lived. Failing that, survived. Failing blood given how tragically predictable. You are the great passion of my possessive nurture. The squirrels have already tried for the freesias. Freshly tilled compost, her blood inviting of incursion, down, 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 done to the itch at my root. We may say there is a timeline of sorts. She has been introduced to half the rooms in this house. That she never observed the camera is contrasted by her children, who never failed to find the lens that blinked once and then was. I seem to have confused myself with my surroundings again. Strip me down to my events. Radsculiator, dog tooth reeting, hand ha fingered, so, so, so shinnel. Koholic, Kroholnik, Fisholsia, Wernuckelal, Close Scabrine, Dend Pinkicks, Eoneath. When I die, I will pay my way with another man's name. David fits well. As an idea, I am not. Will not. Should not. Can not. Prefix not. Suffix. Kron will prize him from my mouth, and I, maintaining a social distance, stand like a coin purse behind the miles of the newly dead. It comforts to know we take up space in the after. Such an abstract expression of the waking world becomes concrete. Tarmac to be built run up on, much like you, the nurse, will not take you blood, I am handled with a professional touch. Blue with dusk, men have tried for my marrow. No glove, shadow the steadfast limit. The body is a risk all its own. New limits are discovered through their creation. And I have yet to learn what, if anything, can be asked for. So that was, that was a poem. There's so much I want to talk about with this poem, and we have so little time. <laughs> I know. The first question I wanted to talk about, which I think is reflected a lot in the language of the poem, but also in the making of it. So the, this last section, with the new limits are discovered through their creation, I wondered if you could talk about that in relationship to the reading and the limits of this recording and this reading because there were parts that were in brackets that you didn't read that luckily the audience was able to read but that's a recording that was limited in some way by your reading hmm. yeah i guess okay wow so how do i talk so this poem um in relation to the limits of this recording, but also the limit of the reading experience? That's a big question. So, um, I mean, it, just in terms of like what you're thinking about in terms of like limits, because I think this poem is really structured mm, as well. So that yeah. can be broader in terms of limitation uh, as, an, as a way of thinking in this poem. Oh yeah, no, okay, okay, no, that's absolutely, that's absolutely spot on because limitation was, um, the, the central conceit of this poem, limiting. So I'm uh, right. Okay. So I am obsessed with the idea of linguistic units of meaning, the way that a single line or a single phrase um, has independent meaning, um, 
and then meaning in the wider piece, and then the relationship between those two things and how it endlessly extrapolates out um, into like really bizarre abstractions and new meaning structures that couldn't exist on their own, like if you divorce those two statements from each other. Um, and I guess I structured this around limits to reflect that. I wanted to write a poem that um, could be read in a multitude of ways, had to be read in a multitude of ways in order for it to make sense. Um, part of why I added the grayed out text was to talk about limits imposed by kind of me as a writer, kind of like saying like, oh, well, this word just isn't as important right now, but it's still included in the poem, so it's obviously important. So then there's this kind of um, formal suggestion of meaning really is a series of choices rather than as a definitive declarative thing. No, no, that's perfect. That's what I was getting at. I wasn't being like, how does this recording exactly? <laughs> no, sure, 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 yeah. sure, sure. Yeah. The other thing I was thinking about was as you were reading it, um, which I see a lot in your writing in particular, but in this piece, I think comes out a lot. Um, is this relationship between a you and an I and this complicating of the self. Um, you say, confuse myself with my surroundings and there's so much surroundings in this mm. poem. Like, how do you factor self in when you're writing that? Oh, so I, I am super critical of, of, of the self. Both outside of poetry in my life, I'm very critical of myself, but I'm also very critical of assertions of self in poetry as though that's as though someone else's idea of selfhood is a pathway to um higher meaning which kind of i which i appreciate on one level like okay so someone else's eye is different to mine through empathy i can gain understanding of, of something else but i think that that is that's like a very prosaic sentiment. That's something that I think is in novels, but is increasingly in poetry as people start to self mythologize through poetry and performance. And I'm just, I'm really critical of that because people use I as though it's like, well, this is real, this is true because I, 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 you know, I am a living testament to that is truth and reality. I'm very critical of that um, because I don't think, I just think it's really limiting. I think the I is limiting and I think the reason that I extrapolate into kind of like you, capital Y you, is because it's a vessel for so much more than I. I much prefer direct address to self-address because I feel, I feel self-address is a closed loop, whereas you is completely open to so much more possibility. And often what I deal with is the delineation of self through a you. So kind of this idea, especially in, in romantic paradigms or parental or familial paradigms, um, this idea of being a self through an other um, and the I gaining meaning through the you um, and the ways in which that can kind of create a weird co linguistic codependency as well. Um, so that, that's something that, that's why I have um, the context of this poem as a screenshot is especially significant there because the I and the I've and the names uh, with the exception of Kron, um, have that red autocorrect squiggle in Word. You couldn't have that if I just printed the poem out. Um, so, yeah, there's also this idea of like a snapshot of it being a screenshot, like of a, of, of a point in time of a sense of self. And I think that in terms of composition as well, I think you can quite clearly tell that I wrote this during this pandemic yeah. <laughs> because it's like, oh, I, I confuse myself with my surroundings. You know, I'm, I'm obsessed with what is around me and, and that feels like me because the I... And there's this train of thought in psychology where like the I doesn't really exist without the you. Like we are relational creatures without yeah. you. Like literally without you in this moment, I would just be talking to a camera. You know what I mean? It wouldn't mean anything. Um, so yeah, I'm really obsessed with ideas like that. And that, and that comes out in the poem through those ways. That's gorgeous. I think we might have to move on to the second part, not to bring the you of the ego of the me in, but I think we might have to. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fine. I said no. a lot. Yeah. <laughs> no, that was, I think we, ha even though it was only a couple of questions, I think we get so much more from hearing you talk a little mm. bit more about. And it's mm -hmm. exciting to talk about myself like I'm talking about someone else's poems. So Roma Havers, who's about to read a poem for you, 
has also done a lot of other things. Roma Havers is a Manchester-based queer poet and theatre maker whose current work explores failing bodies, outness, and how poetry can shorthand memory into something new. While working with Young Identity, she has been commissioned by Home, Manchester Histories, and Manchester International Festival. She has also performed for radio, television, and festivals, including Hay Festival and BBC Contains Strong Language. In July 2019, she was poet in residence for MMU Special Collections Library. Her first solo show, Bolted, debuted with UK Young Artists in February 2019, and her second solo show, Lob, a tennis poetry bonanza, launched with the LGBT Consortium in January 2020. And this very same Roma Havers of stage and screen is about to read to you a poem entitled How to Hide the Pink of Smarting. God, yeah, that really brings out the, the brutalizing of having your bio read is seeing your face the whole time is happening. <laughs> this, very yeah, that. This is the poem. This very bad idea is keeping you alive. At some point, you will have to recover from survival. Want for wanting's sake. For now, body is a sickle. Suckle don't drown. Sometimes a drown gets better with age. Head as an accent, you must understand. Laughter is tanned if you are a tin. A rage is an outside that wants you back in. Want is a word you don't always have. Make nurse a verb. Make patient a badge that you can remove the pink off. Smarting. You should know better is a neighbour who has a milkman. When you are better is the opposite of time. Time is the neighbour who won't mend the fence because it is your fence. A fence is a neighbour who won't learn your name. You don't need a name until you can want. This very bad idea is keeping you alive. Alive is a feeling that you cannot hide. Tunnel a hidey into the sink. Nest, never nestle, like recovery. Fawn, hide, nettle, formaldehyde, fawning over a gully, galleria. A sink, sinkhole, is a place where dirt disappears. Oh, I was muted so it didn't hear my clap. There we go. <laughs> yeah, it looked odd, but I liked it. Yeah, we love we love a bit of um you know ludo narrative dissonance between what is happening and and what is actually experienced. Okay, um, so lovely poem. Well, lovely is the wrong word. Lovely is the wrong word because it clearly grapples with trauma as a central conceit, the ways it conceals itself through behaviour, and how we try to move past that without repressing it, which mm. I think is very topical i think it's very relatable to kind of wider quarantine experiences but i think is also kind of a central danger slash experience of queerness in the modern day um especially when it comes to producing queer art um because yeah. there's, there's this thing where you have to pedal a certain form of queerness to people that aren't queer to get platforms but also trying to maintain true to yourself and, and actually being queer, which is a really strange dichotomy. Um, and what jumped out to me most was the use of the word pink. Um, and so my first question to you is, what is your relationship to the colour pink? <laughs> That's such a good question. <coughs> okay, the first thing I thought about is when I was five, my mum put me and my sister in ballet lessons just because like, that's what her friends were doing with their five-year-old girls. And I quit after a year because I hated the color pink. And now um, I'm making a dance show and I'm thinking a lot about ballet and I'm thinking a lot about like gender's relationship to ballet and the language of ballet being so gendered and so pink. <laughs> um, so I hated pink for a long time, but now I'm just like, it's a color that my mm. face is a lot. Okay, it's interesting that you would kind of frame it as like it's just a colour, because I actually, I, I don't think your poetry really suggests that it's just a colour. I think, because you, you, you 
you return to a conceit of, of pink a few times or kind of pink as a metaphor for something larger and kind of pink contains certain gendered expectations of course but you do something different with it so in this poem you explicitly link pink to pain you say how to hide the pink of smarting so pink as as evidence of of suffering which in a kind of context of a feminist poetics is interesting so the idea of being a woman is painful but you have to conceal the pain but womanhood is evidence of that pain that kind of cyclical thing which is you know kind of echoed throughout the really hyper relational neighbor stuff that goes on mm. in the poem where it just becomes really abstract and the interconnectedness of everything kind of loses meaning in a meaningful way um but to tie that back to pink you use pink in another way in another poem called changing rooms which you included in a uh, your debut uh, your 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 second um solo show sophomore show lob currently a work in progress um in a poem called changing rooms mm -hmm. and you talk about um pink like post corset rib um and then kind of you substitute the closet for the locker and then you say um very pink hint of musk and there's this weird double edge there of pink being painful but also pleasurable through your use of um contraction and release mm. um and i was wondering how does how, how that that's my reading of it but how does the pink in this poem relate to the pink in changing rooms for you i think pink in this poem is about evidence and it's about evidence of survival um sort of leaving its mark but in some way that that there's a knowledge relationship because of the the double meaning of smarting um but that it's something that you can sort of peel off um and you can take off but also the, the movement of the poem to me is so much about like the way you have to tunnel in to get out and the the, the pinkness is is a way back in and finding a new relationship within mm. and um it's just like a nice word as well mm. pink and sink i think is the, like the rhyme that time ties the whole poem together to have this like pinkness that sinks and it leaves mm. but sinking is a kind of way of removing the evidence and but also staying at the same time mm. yeah yeah, because I think I was thinking a lot about like survival in terms of what's it going to be like when we leave. Mm. We're all talking about how we're going to survive this, but what's it like? What's the aftermath? Mm. What do we make when we can want again? Mm, which is an excellent question. Yeah. And when when you were going when you were just talking about kind of how pink means different things in this poem and in your wider catalogue, something that jumped out to me was you talked about in this. Um, and I actually haven't made that association, which is quite funny because I'd link, I was one step away by linking it to changing rooms, but that kind of the internals being like pink and squishy and soft, um, and, and delicate and vulnerable. Um, but then that you link that to inness because inness and outness and that kind of like being visible, um, being outed is something that you grapple with so much through your work. So like through agoraphobia and bolted through the rules of uh, the sports hall, the tennis court and the changing room in, in lob. Um, it's, it's something you talk about a lot. Um, and kind of Jose Esteban Munoz, my favorite academic, um, kind of writes about this thing called queer ephemera, um, which is how queerness inherently queers those that are in proximity to queerness. It's like, you know, the ephemera rubs off on you like, like glitter. Um, and that, because you always grapple through with queerness through ideas of, of proximity and delineation. So kind of ha, ha, what, what does that mean to you? That idea of kind of stuff rubbing off and kind of queerness as a, as a, as a proximal gesture as about space between things like people and ideas. I think, um, that's such a good question. There's <laughs> so much in there um, in terms of like thinking about space and, also poetry is the medium of expression that allows me to go back in 
and work out the language of in first because there's so much responsibility for queer people to work out the language of out first like work out how you are going to make this presentable to others but um if you do that before you work out the in then out doesn't exist because there's no in that's in relation to so then you do develop the the in this becomes others because that's the relationship the out version of you and then the, the perceived inness of others. So I think it's a way of working back in once you've been out, in, out, shake it all about. Mm. Mm. Yeah, because people are expected to put a different amount into the out. You know what I mean? And, and, and that's a crazy thing that always comes across in your work. Okay, and I guess one final question, and this is just to link back to the central theme of the poem which i think is is, is growing past something and, and being able to articulate something internally and articulate it externally without doing damage to yourself or those around you um and i guess do you feel like it is possible to write queer content which is do you think that there is a pressure as a queer writer to be innovative? Um, I don't think of it as a pressure. I think it is um, a potential that can be reached for. Um, I think it depends if you... <sighs> I don't think of it as responsibility. I think it is possibility and and an exciting opportunity to be innovative. Mm. But then I also think that there's, to some extent, a responsibility to be innovative. Whatever you're making, whoever you are, mm. maybe that's not being fair. No, but what, what you're touching on there is, is quite a humanitarian gesture, this idea of if you are going to create, create, some, create something that, that pushes us in a new direction create yeah. something that affects a change rather than just aping tradition? I think it, it, it's the difference between a responsibility to like make something entirely new, which I think is impossible, mm. and the responsibility to like think of it in a new way, mm. which is our only real way out of just making the same thing over and over. Mm. And that to me is what innovation is which is thinking in new ways and thinking around things in new ways. And I think there's a strong history of queer writers doing that um, mm. out of necessity as much as anything. Um, but I think it is everybody's responsibility. But I think you should look to, I think there's a, a canon of queer writers that have done that in a way that many other writers haven't. So they should pay attention to them. Thank you so much for watching our little series. We hope it offered probing questions, a writing prompt or two, and made some space for thinking outside of this time. All of these writers are now creating new, exciting, vital work, some of which we have shared in the comments below, so do check out their work online. I'd like to thank our writers, Mandler, Ella, Rosie, Oki, and Frankie for gathering with me and with such openness. I'd also like to thank the MIF team for all their support putting this together. Please reply in the comments. Now that you have our attention, how would you like to be read?